be turning there. Uh, we will take a, a passage, a, a verse from there to kind of serve as the basis of our study. We'll look around in several places in this book, but uh, if you'll be turning there, uh, we'll be ready to go. Uh, I, I join with Roger, first of all, in welcoming you this evening, and uh, in, in the, the high regard for all the lessons that have uh, taken place through the week, it's been uh, enjoyable and rewarding. Yeah, one of the things about preaching that you figure out pretty quick is you don't get to hear anybody else preach uh, very often. And if, if these other guys are like I am, I really get sick and tired of hearing what I have to say and what I think and what I've studied. And it is a rewarding thing uh, to get to hear uh, these other men as they talk about the same kinds of things that, that, that I talk about uh, at home. I mean, our work is the same. Uh, we are folks trying to help people serve God and apply the Bible. And uh, as Dad is wont to say, uh, the preaching is, is the, the message of the gospel in, in all these different personalities, and it is a great blessing. And so thanks to, to Ralph and to Roger and to Dad. Uh, I know Roger's nervously uh, anticipating whatever uh, snappy repartee I may have for him this evening. Uh, and, and I'm just going to save it till tomorrow uh, so, so he can sweat it out. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, my Uncle Jay died. And uh, Mom and Dad and my sister and I were flying to Lubbock uh, to go to be a part of Jay's funeral. And uh, there was a big storm came through Dallas the day uh, that we were, the night that we were supposed to fly in the next morning. And uh, much of the, uh, the community around uh, Love Field was having bad flooding problems, and a lot of the early morning flights had gotten changed or rerouted. And, and uh, it, as you know, if you've done any flying, the, the airport got shut down for a while, and <coughs> Our planes got canceled, and uh, because we were a little bit concerned about making it to Lubbock on time on Saturday, Friday morning, I drove to uh, Houston, uh, which is about an hour and a half from my house, and we got in Mom and Dad's car, and we drove to Lubbock, uh, which is another, what did we figure, nine hours, something like that. It was, it was a long day. If you ever drive across West Texas, uh, which I would highly recommend, especially to Roger, who needs all the culture he can get, uh, <laughs> When you get from Interstate 20, which runs through Abilene and then Sweetwater, and if you're going to Lubbock, you take Highway 84 and you start going up through the, the kind of rocky, ragged terrain and until you come to Post Texas, you come up on top of the Cap Rock. That, that hour, hour and a half drive between Sweetwater and Post is full of wind turbines. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you shaking your head, some of you are like, no. Uh, a wind turbine varies in height. Uh, the tower itself varies anywhere from 100 to 200 feet high with uh, blades, three big blades. You've seen pictures of these big, white, tall structures that are glorified windmills. And the blades themselves or anywhere from 100 to 150 feet. And so when the blades are upturned, you may have a structure out there in the middle of the field uh, 400 feet high. And, and, and that country is just full of those things. And the, the, the Friday that we were driving up, there was just hardly a breath of wind, which is actually very unusual for that part of the country. But those wind turbines were, were slowly moving. They just didn't take anything for this massive structure to be moved by the wind. And, and the interesting thing about this is you, you can't see the wind. Uh, and, and really, to be honest with you, if you stood out there at the base of those wind turbines, you probably wouldn't feel the wind on that day. Uh, but because wind is an elusive kind of thing. It, it is simply air in motion. But uh, as the Lord reminded uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, uh, you can see the effects of wind, but you don't see it. And it is one of those things in life that can be very, very pleasant if it's a hot day in North Alabama and it gets up 90, 95 degrees and you get a little breeze. I assume maybe you get a little breeze off the river. Uh, you get a little breeze off the river in the morning or in the evening because of the temperature change between the water and the land. That breeze is just the most pleasant thing in the world. But on a hot summer evening in the spring when a tornado comes blowing through, that same pleasant breeze can become absolutely the most horrifying thing in the world. 
And that's kind of the nature of wind. It, it is a, a very elusive kind of, of force that God has created as He has made in this world. It's very unpredictable. It is something that we can use, but we don't really harness it. Uh, we can produce energy from it, but it can turn around and absolutely destroy the very things that are used to harness it. If you ever see a video of one of these turbines that get out of balance, the same wind that turns that big propeller and produces energy will absolutely destroy the entire tower as it starts wobbling. It, it, wind is an interesting thing. And God uses wind from time to time in the imagery of the Bible for a number of ways, but predominantly in the Bible when God talks about wind, it's in a negative way. And such is the case in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. This is perhaps the most famous verse from Hosea. It is a verse that is that, that is transcended biblical use. You, you hear people make this observation from time to time. Hosea says to the people of Israel, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. And that is, a, Dad would say, a very pregnant passage of Scripture because not only is he talking about the devastation of what happened to these people, he's talking about the emptiness and the vanity of what they had done with their lives. I want to back up as we start this study. I want to remind you of a couple of things that we've already touched on as we've uh, looked at this time period through the week. Hosea is a contemporary with Amos and a contemporary with Micah, the, the, the prophets we've studied from the last two evenings. Uh, he would have done his work predominantly in the northern kingdom during the reign of, of, of Jeroboam II, who was a very, very prosperous king who reigned in great wealth because God had seen the oppression of the Syrians that they were bringing upon the northern kingdom. And because, because God was compassionate toward his people, he had allowed the nation some degree of wealth, expecting those in charge to, to bring relief to those that were afflicted. And the, the common criticism that God makes of his people under Jeroboam's reign is that, is that they were covetous, they were immoral, they were idolaters, uh, they, they pursued their lust. In fact, if you back up, you see a listing. Let's just look at two or three verses like we did last night. You see a listing in Hosea that's very much like what we read last night from Amos. Hosea chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. The Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There's no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint. With bloodshed upon bloodshed, therefore the land will mourn. Everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. You go over to a little later in the chapter, skip down two or three verses in verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priests for me. Because you've forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I'll change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity. It will be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. They shall eat but not have enough. They will commit harlotry but not increase because they have ceased obeying God. And in this book particularly, the charge that God makes against them in all of these areas is a charge that has to do with their relationship to God. Hosea is very unique. It may be the most intensely personal of the minor prophets because of the way that the book works. If you look back in chapter 1, I and how many of you are familiar with this book? Because if you're already familiar with it, I'm going to spend a lot of time. Uh, uh, two hands. Okay, elders, take note of this. Okay, teach the minor prophets here soon. Okay? Uh, Hosea is a man that God offered a very interesting instruction toward. In, in chapter 1, God tells Hosea in verse 2, Go take yourself a wife of harlotry and, and children of harlotry, because the land has committed harlotry by departing from the Lord. This is the predominant problem that God's dealing with in the book of Hosea. His people hadn't just committed adultery against him, 
Remember, they had entered into a covenant with God all the way back at, at Sinai. And then again in Deuteronomy, when Moses sends them into the land and Joshua takes them in, they commit or, the, or they enter into the covenant, they renew it, the next generation. They are married to God. And what God says is, you, you've not just committed adultery, you've committed harlotry. And so God tells Hosea, I want you to go take a wife of harlotry. And scholars debate this. What, what, did he take a wife who was a prostitute? Or did he take a wife just from the people of the culture? I, my suspicion is, he, he doesn't go marry a prostitute. My suspicion is that he takes a woman who's just typical of the age. She's not any different than any other woman. She's not more godly. She's just your typical Israelite girl. And as the first chapter goes along, we find, and her name is Gomer. As the, the first chapter goes along, we find that Gomer gives Hosea a son. Notice verse 3. She conceived and bore him a son. That's very telling. Because when you get to verse 6, it says she conceived again and bore a daughter. Do you know the difference do you notice the difference other than the gender? It doesn't say she conceived and bore him a daughter. It says she conceived and bore a daughter. And as you go along again in verse 8, when she had weaned the daughter, she conceived and bore a son. Once again, didn't conceive and bear him a son, conceived and bore a son. And you get a sense of what's happening because God tells Hosea, you're going to name this last child lo Ami." which means not my people. The chances are pretty good Hosea's first child was his own and his second and third were born to him because his wife was unfaithful. And what's unspoken at this point in the, in the story is that clearly either Hosea puts her away or she just goes off and leaves him. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest with you. In chapter 2, God begins talking about the relationship between himself and the children of Israel. And, and, and he draws this parallel. And what he's wanting Hosea to do is understand how God's feeling. Ralph this morning was talking about being a father to three daughters and, and, and his general emotional disposition and, and what raising girls does to augment that. I, I don't share Ralph's general emotional disposition. I have my passion, but it's not sorrow, it's anger. Uh, and, and, and I mean that in all seriousness. Tracy and I had an interesting discussion about that today. And, 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 but raising girls will, will produce a, a softer side of you. And we sometimes hesitate to show people how things hurt us or how things affect us. We, we don't all get moved to tears at the Little Mermaid. Even though we may be influenced by the Little Mermaid. And I'm going to tell you something about God that he's trying to reveal to Hosea so that we will understand. When God's people leave God, it hurts God. When God's people are unfaithful to God, God is angered. God is the husband watching his wife go bear children to others. And if you read all of Hosea chapter 2, that's what God's saying to the nation of Israel. Verse 2, bring charges against your mother. Bring charges. She's not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her side, her adulteries from between her breasts, lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I will not have mercy on her children, for they're the children of harlotry. Their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water and my wool and my linen and my oil and my drink. And, and God goes on to say, I've, I've, I've had enough of it. Now, just so you understand that there is also a hopeful nature to this book, at this point, God says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to punish you in ways that you can't imagine. I'm going to let you pay for what you have done. And when I'm finished punishing you, I'm going to come back and take you to myself again and show you how much I love you. And my punishment, and 
and my love are going to draw you back home. Then you get to chapter 3, and what God says to Hosea is, I want you to go find Gomer. Obviously, she's not part of his life now. And I want you to buy her. She's not only committed adultery, she has prostituted herself to the point that she is now someone's property. And I want you to buy her. And I want you to bring her back. And, and, And I want you to set her by herself. I want you to feed her. I want you to clothe her. But I want you to isolate her. And I want you to be as faithful to her as you expect her to be to you. And then she'll come back to you. And that's the message that God offers His people. It is an old message. If you study the book of Deuteronomy very carefully, God tells the children of Israel before they ever go into the land of Canaan, all the way back into chapter 11, you're going to leave me, and when you leave me, I'm going to punish you, and I'm going to make it really hard, but but I'm going to circumcise your hearts, and I'm going to bring you back, and you're going to come back to me, and you're going to be a different person when you come back to me. Ralph's lessons about repentance are the lessons that God told the children of Israel he was going to teach them before he ever sent them into the promised land. You're going to mess up. I'm going to punish you. It's going to break your heart. You're going to loathe yourself. You're going to see how good I am, and you're going to come running back to me. There's repentance. And it is illustrated in the life of Hosea. Now, I offer this time in the introduction because I want you to understand two things just from the introduction. The way we live our lives impacts our God, folks. You you know, I I, I can't speak for God, but I can show you what God reveals about himself in the scriptures. When Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, that's not some academic articulation. What Paul's telling the Romans is, you go back in the Old Testament and you read about God and you learn how God is. And you get to see how God reacts in different circumstances. And the more you read about Him, the more you find out that I can trust Him. I can trust what He says to me. Faith comes by hearing God's Word. You want to learn about how God uh, reacts in your life and what God expects of you and how God expects us to live. You go back and read how God dealt with people for several thousand years. And then you'll have reason to put your trust in a God who promises us some things, as Dad's been talking about, as Ralph's been talking about. So so I want you to appreciate at the outset God's people and our service affect our God. And and, and also think it's worth noting that there are people who have gone before us whose God has expected to do things the likes of which we just can't imagine. Do not go crying to, to, to Kenny or to the elders here, or to your elders wherever you are, or to the local preacher, or to your best friend about how bad your life is serving God. God hasn't asked you to go take a woman of the age who he knows is going to commit adultery and then ask you to buy her back. Mercy. All these complaints that Roger talked about, shame on us. Look at, look at what God asked Hosea to do. Look at God, what God asked Jeremiah to do. Look at God, what God asked Daniel to do. What, what we need is some people that will stand up and quit whining about how bad we've got it and have the courage to stand up and go serve the Lord. Now, now we'll get on to the sermon. When in Hosea chapter 8... God makes this point about sowing wind and and reaping the whirlwind. I I want you to appreciate that what what he's addressing is the fact that the children of Israel had brought upon themselves the judgment of God. And and that's really the point that that I want to make this evening. I want to elaborate a little bit on a couple of things. But I, I want you to appreciate that the imagery that God offers is, here are my people... I've given them opportunities. I've given them blessings. I've I've allowed them to have these things. I've given them a covenant. They know what I expect of them. 
Uh, they, they know what I promised for them, and they've spent their entire life planting garbage. And I'm going to punish them. I'm going to punish them for it. That's a message for us, folks. It, it, it is a message that resonates throughout God's dealing with mankind. We are spending our life planting stuff. And the, the question that we will begin with and end with is just what is it that you're sowing? Now, I want to make a couple of observations. First one is it's really, really easy to sow junk in this life. And, and that's the point that he makes when he says they've sown wind. In, in Ecclesiastes, when Solomon wants to describe how empty satisfaction is in life and how fleeting it is, he, taught, he calls it grasping after the wind. You, you, you reach out and, and, and there's nothing there when you grab hold of it. And I tell you, there, there are so many people in this world who spend so much time involved in garbage. And, and you want to know why that is the case? You, you want to know why the children of Israel sowed wind? Because spiritual destitution is really easy. <laughs> in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus talks about the, the straight and the narrow way. Luke chapter 13, there's an interesting way that Jesus uses the same imagery when somebody asks him, are there few who are saved? And Jesus doesn't say it out and out, but basically says, yeah, <laughs> there are few that are saved. But his answer is you need to strive to enter into the, to the narrow gate. I want you to notice how he describes the broad gate in Matthew chapter 7. Broad is the gate and wide is the way that leads to destruction. And, and there are many who go in. You want to know why a lot of people are going to lose their souls? Because it is really easy to lose your soul. In, in, the, in the book of Psalms, and I, and I mentioned that this is, a, this is a concept that resonates throughout scriptures. In the first psalm, the psalmist writes, and this is, and I think it's not without... Uh, planning on the part of God. that This is the very first psalm. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Uh, the reference has been made several times. I, I like to play golf. I like to fish. I, I like to bird hunt. The, the interesting similarity of those three things is they are all very powerfully affected by wind. If you're playing golf, if the wind's blowing really hard, you have to play for that. You, you see guys throwing grass up and they're, they're checking which way the wind's blowing. Uh, and, and, and they do that because they have to make adjustments. What I want you to appreciate is it doesn't take anything for the wind to blow a piece of grass off. And that's the point that the psalmist is making. You, you want to know why so many people are ungodly in this world? It's just the easiest thing to do. And, and it is something that we need to be warned about. There's no effort in being ungodly. There's no control that has to be exercised. You don't have to give any grand allegiance to God. You don't have to be a grateful person. You don't have to be a responsible person. You don't have to worry about leadership. You don't have to care about fellowship. You don't have to care about love or faith or hope. Repentance is nothing. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, when, the, when Paul is, is addressing this congregation, actually uh, about many of the things Roger talked about tonight, uh, about the, the, the purpose of, of God's gifts as he has given the word to different people with different capacities. In Ephesians 4, he, he starts addressing this in verse 11. Actually, begins it earlier than that. But in verse 11, he, 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 gave himself, uh, he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now what that means very simply is God gave everybody all these different abilities so that every one of us can help each other be just like Jesus. The, the gospel's not a terribly hard concept. You're right. We, we don't have to understand Calvinism. It helps us in defending Calvinism, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. Jesus died so you can be forgiven, so you can be like Jesus. That's the gospel. And, and we need to get back to emphasizing that in our local congregations 
that this is what we're trying to accomplish in, in, in our work. We're trying to help each other serve the Lord, and that's his point. But I want you to notice verse 14, that we no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Why is it important that the elders lead well and, and help make sure that the, that the church is well taught? Why is it important that we give attendance to, to repentance and making sure we're changing our will to bring it into a line with God? Why is love important in a practical way so that we treat each other and everyone else right and, and hope and faith? Why are these things so very significant? So we don't get blown around. And it is easy to get blown around. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and, and, and I would especially ask you young people to turn over to this passage, and if you, if you take notes in your Bible, I'd ask you young people to, to underline this one. Even if you're grabbing a pew Bible, underline it in that one. Maybe it'll help somebody <laughs> later on. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, I want you to notice what he says in verse 9. And, and this is in connection, where Solomon's about to go is, life gets dark when you get old. And that's where he's going in chapter 12. Look. Life's going to get hard when you get old because you're not going to feel good anymore and all these physical things are going to happen to you and life's just going to get hard. And it's not going to be very pleasant and enjoyable. So he says in verse 9 of chapter 11, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. In other words, enjoy being young. Go play ball. Go eat 12 pizzas if you can eat that many. Have at it. You're not going to be able to do that stuff when you get older. Rejoice when you're young. But know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. It's easy to be young to justify all the junk that you're sowing. To go do whatever you want to do and say, well, this is what I like and this is what I'm fun. I'm sowing my wild oats. And, and, and there's, no, there's no call for any kind of discipline. And, and, and yet what the, what the writer is telling you is you, you better understand that God's going to judge you because the appeal is in the ease of it all. It's, it's in the laziness. It is the rich man in Luke chapter 12 saying, Soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Now, I want you to understand something about Christianity that I think we need to, to underscore more than we do when it comes to this idea of sowing wind. Christianity is not easy. Uh, that, that one of the great perversions that Satan has pulled on, on, on our country and our world is all, all you got to do is believe and be honest and sincere and God's just going to take care of you. And, and I do think you have to believe and I do think you have to be honest and sincere. But, but if you think that's all there is to Christianity, you are sadly mistaken. It is not an easy thing that God asks us to do. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. Follow me. The, the, the idea of self-denial is the hardest part. We always emphasize all oh, the taking over the cross. That means you're going to be crucified. That means you're, yeah, that would have been a hard thing. And to be honest with you, following Jesus is pretty hard. I'm not sure I could have hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. In fact, I feel pretty sure that that wouldn't have been my disposition. But the hardest thing is deny yourself. Because I want to do what I want to do. Because what I want to do is easy. I don't have to focus. I don't have to work at it. I don't have to deny myself any. I just go with the flow. I take it easy. And yet what God asks of us is that we learn to be self-controlled people. It is one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It is something we are added to our faith in 2 Peter chapter 1. And yet, how often do we talk about this? How often do we preach about the demands of self-control? We were talking at the supper table tonight about one of the challenges of the growth uh, and the acceptance of homosexuality in our society. And, and, and the way the issue needs to be addressed is, regardless of where your affections are, maybe you do feel an affection for the same sex. Maybe you feel an affection for the opposite sex. Maybe you're short-tempered. Maybe you are impatient. You know what God demands of you? You control that. You exercise some discipline in your life. 
You make sure, as he addresses in James chapter 1, that you're not giving in to the temptations of what you desire to do. That's easy. It is easy to give in. We need to be people who don't. Now, we could preach another lesson on this. It it is a topic that I feel very passionate about. I I would just simply say to you, you you need to learn ways to to learn discipline in your life. Discipline's a learned (coughs) process. I'm convinced in my own thinking that that may have been part of the reason that God made clean and unclean meats in the Old Testament. Because in the New Testament, there's not any difference. You can eat bacon if you want to eat bacon. Don't call anything I've, 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 uh, that I've created common or unclean. So what was the difference? And you say, well, it was about holiness. Yes, it was, but it was also about control. You don't eat bacon because God said, don't eat bacon. And, and our reaction, but bacon smells really good and tastes really good. Yes, it does, but I said, don't eat bacon. Now, I don't know how you go about teaching yourself Self-control. I try to exercise regularly. When I don't like to and want to some days, I still try to because it helps me to remind myself that my mind is in control of my body, that I don't have to give in to temptation, as James chapter 1 says. And and I'm not advocating pure asceticism, but God demands of his people self-control. And wind is easy to plant because it requires none of that. And I want you to appreciate God's perspective in that. Remember what he said in Hosea chapter 2. These people have committed harlotry. You know, what they had done is they had started perverting the worship of God. They'd built golden calves and they were worshiping the way they wanted to worship. And then they had also accepted the the gods of the lands, the Baals. Uh, The Baals would be localized gods, gods of harvest, gods of the the sun, gods of the rain, god of the mountains, gods of the valleys. And and they began to attribute their blessings to these other gods and not to Jehovah. And that's the sense where in chapter 2 he talks about the fact that they have committed harlotries and they've chased their other lovers and said these are the ones that are responsible for all of my blessings. Remember, this is a period of great prosperity where God had blessed them. And instead of seeing God as the source of their blessing, they gave credit elsewhere. And, and, and what sowing wind does to God is actually quite scary. You and I were made in the image and the likeness of God. And when I give my life to junk, I run around chasing my sexual desires, or I run around chasing my covetous desires, or I give myself to my pride, or I just unleash my anger whenever I want to, or I just live however I want to live. What I have done is I have taken what God gave me in his own image, and I have prostituted myself. Do you ever think of yourself that way? Because that's the perspective of God when we engage ourselves, when we bury ourselves in sin. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So so I want you to appreciate the very outset when he says in Hosea chapter 8 to these people, you've sown the wind. That's an easy thing to do. And we need to recognize the vanity of it. Now, I'm going to make a second observation. When he says, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And, and the observation I want to make doesn't have so much the, 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 the emphasis upon the concept of the whirlwind. We would say a tornado. Okay? Uh, where I grew up, there's a difference between a whirlwind and a tornado. We call whirlwinds dust devils. And they'd, they'd come running down the Caliche Road out in front of our house maybe 15, 20 feet tall, they'd pick up a little dust, and the funnest thing in the world is run out there and get in the middle of it because the wind's just going all over. Now, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you, you sow junk, and what you're going to get out of that is a tornado. It's going to be destruction. That's the way God's using the terminology. The point I want you to make is you are going to reap if you sow, and, and you're sowing something. If you go over to chapter 10 in, in Hosea and down to verse 13, Actually, beginning in verse 12, 
He says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You've plowed wickedness and you've reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way and the multitude of your mighty men. So tumult shall arise among your people and all your fortresses will be plundered. In other words, you're going to get your comeuppance. Now, you may not think you will, and that is the great deception of sowing wind. We look around, we may live 30 years before we reap any consequences of our actions. We may spend all of our time just living like the rest of the world, and, and God doesn't do anything to us about that. Yet the consistent principle in the Bible is you're going to reap. Uh, keep your bookmark there in Hosea chapter 8. Now, I want you to flip over to the book of Galatians in the New Testament. I want you to see Paul teaches the same thing to the Galatian churches. And, 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 and not without purpose, the Galatian purpose, uh, churches have a lot of garbage going on. They're sowing some wind in these groups. They're fighting and fussing one another over, uh, over fellowship issues, the very thing Roger talked about last night. Here I am quoting you again, you know. Let me do it this way. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul. Okay, now that five or six. So I've got, and only two to you. All right, so you can't say tonight I quoted you more than Paul. Roger just talked to us last night about fellowship. And these people are sowing wind because their issue is, I don't like what Kenny has to say because Kenny's a Jew and, and, and I'm a Gentile. And, and Kenny believes that, that he has to eat certain things or observe certain days. And I don't believe that Kenny thinks I have to believe that. And I don't like it that Kenny thinks I have to believe that. And, and here you go. And these, these congregations are having problems. Devouring and biting one another, he says in chapter 5 and verse 15. Not walking according to spiritual principles, giving themselves over to the easy things, walking in the flesh. So when he gets to chapter 6 and starts making these practical applications and tells them to bear one another's burdens and examine his own work, when he gets down to verse 7, he says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he's going to reap. You sow to the flesh, of the flesh you'll reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, of the spirit you'll reap everlasting life. Make no mistake, folks, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna reap. Back in Hosea in chapter 7 and verse 2, Hosea writes, They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. And their own deeds have surrounded them, and they are before my face. I, as Ralph's talked about repentance, he's made a couple of illustrations about, well, you know, I did something years ago that I really regret, or, or I've, buried, I've carried this burden around with me. And I want you to understand something. God doesn't forget what we've done. Uh, uh, undealt with sin is not just hanging around, floating out there in the atmosphere somewhere. What God tells these people is, I know what you did. You haven't fooled me. I haven't forgotten. We say, yeah, but God talks about your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Yeah, to his people that are serving him and that are penitent and, and, and that are faithful to him. But, but people that are sowing wind, you think God's just forgetting the garbage that you're dealing with in your life? You young people, you, you, you think that you can go out and live how you want to and God doesn't know what's happening? Proverbs chapter 4 is one of my favorite passages. This is We do a memory verse every month. This is our memory verse uh, for the month at home. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, which says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. I want you to look at this entire little section beginning in verse uh, 20. My son, give attention to my words and incline your ear to my sayings, and do not let them depart from your eyes, and keep them in the midst of your heart. Their life to those who find them and health to their flesh... Keep your heart with all diligence. Out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and perverse lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Let your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Don't turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. You know what he's saying? Look where you're going. Understand that if you walk down that path, you better think about what's out there. The analogy that we've used with our kids is when you set up dominoes in a row and you push one of them over, the way sin works is they start falling one after another. When you're 15, 16, 17, you sometimes only see the most immediate effects of your sin. The older you get, the, the more dominoes you see falling out there. And that is precisely what Solomon's trying to get his children to see. The consequences of sin aren't always immediate. And, and this is not just for our young people, it's for all of us. 
if you're raising your children and you're not bringing them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You men, if, if, if you give a lot more attention to your work and your occupation so you've made sure and provided for their college and yet you're not providing for them spiritually, you may not see the impact of that for a few years. You know that. While they're at home and, and under your guidance and your leadership, the chances are pretty good that they'll respect you enough, if for no other reason than because you're paying the bill, that they'll go to services when you want them to go, and they'll, they'll probably even participate in worship because you encourage that. But I'm going to tell you, down the road, the consequences always come out. Israel set up the golden calves 200 years before Hosea prophesied. Moses hit the rock instead of speaking to it. While the children of Israel were wandering out in the winter, a long time before it comes time to go into the promised land. Lot chose to move in the direction of Sodom a long time before God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. But all those men suffered. And the consequences at times can be quite extreme. The people in Hosea's day are about to go into punishment through Assyrian captivity. Assyria is the first nation, as far as we can tell in history, that actually would go in when they overtook a nation and, and, and carry people off into captivity. Uh, and instead of just keeping a, a, an oppressive force in place, they'd just take all the people away. The Assyrians were brutal. Uh, hi historical records notes that when they engaged in battle, uh, they didn't just kill the opponent, they made sure and behead them. And then they'd take all the heads and stack them up in big pillars so everybody in the enemy could see what's going to happen when you mess with the Assyrians. They would skin the kings that they would kill and take their skins and use them to wallpaper the palace and the pillars in the palace. And when you are a prisoner to the Assyrians and God tells this to the women in Amos chapter 4... They would very often take them and put fish hooks through their cheeks or through their shoulders and chain them together and march them 600, 800 miles from Israel to Assyria in captivity. And those golden calves weren't doing anything for those people then. I'm going to tell you, sin has extreme consequences. David is overwhelmed with lust as he looks at Bathsheba. He goes and takes her, and the dominoes start falling. Next thing you know, he's getting Uriah drunk. The next thing you know, he's getting Uriah killed. Next thing you know, David's oldest son is raping one of David's daughters. And then one of David's younger sons is killing his older son. And then David's at odds with his younger son, who comes back and runs David out of the palace and tries to kill his own father. I mean, the dominoes fell for David. Do you think that David didn't look back as he was older and think, man, I wish I would have turned away that day on the roof and walked off? And that's the way sin works. In fact, I want you to, I want you to turn over to passage with me in Hebrews chapter 10. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you of, of a couple of examples of the wrath of God as it comes to the consequence of sin. While you're turning to Hebrews chapter 10, I want you to remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu when they offered strange fire before God in Leviticus chapter 10 and God killed them with fire from heaven right there because they get what God didn't command. Or I want you to remember 2 Samuel chapter 6 and Uzzah who in the procession that David had authorized is, 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 is driving the ox cart carrying the throne of God up to Jerusalem to, to the new tent that David has built. And when, uh, when, when, when Uzzah reaches back to keep that, that, that uh, ark from falling off the ark, God struck him dead. Or in Acts chapter 5, when uh, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit and God strikes them dead. I've had, a, I've had a young man who now worships with us tell me years ago, said, you know, you shouldn't quote those things as, as descriptive of what happens when you violate God's laws. What are they there for? What else is that supposed to teach us? And he gets a lot more serious than that. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 says, If we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. 
Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who's trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified a common thing. Insulted the spirit of grace. We know him who says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. People are not afraid of God anymore. People don't think God's going to send anybody to hell. When's the last time you were at a funeral and somebody got up and said, You know, old Joe here, he had his flaws, he had his faults. Now, he could be a really nice guy, but... I feel quite certain, oh, Joe's in hell right now. You know, it doesn't matter how bad Joe was. Everybody preaches, oh, Joe, right to heaven. Nobody thinks God's going to send anybody to hell. Do you know what happens when you sow wind, when you're made in the image of God, and you prostitute yourself out for your own desires? You take the blood of Jesus Christ, especially if you're already a Christian, with which you were sanctified. And you just grind it into the dirt. I got three daughters. One of whom is marrying age, not married yet, so applications are available online. <laughs> it better be good, though. <laughs> if I were to kill my daughter for you, And you walked up and spit on her grave. There's no doubt in my mind that I'd kill you. He said, man, that's pretty harsh. I thought you were a Christian. I try to be, but buddy, that would be pushing the limits of what I could endure. You want to know why God's going to send people to hell? Because when we sow wind, we trample underfoot the blood of the covenant wherewith we were sanctified. Is it because he wants to? No. He loved us enough to die for us, but I'm going to tell you folks, there are consequences attached to sowing wind, and we better start realizing it, and we better start living in accordance with it, and we better start preaching it, and we better start practicing it. These people suffered horribly. Because they left the Lord. Now I mentioned to you at the very beginning that that the end of this, God tells Hosea to go back and buy Gomer out of slavery and prostitution and build a hedge around her and basically earn her love and respect again. And, And that's kind of the way that God ends the story of Hosea, the the prophecy of of Hosea, the message of Hosea. Over and over, while God just is horrified at what they have done, God also offers hope. He, He describes his yearning for them, but he also describes what he'll do if they come home. In chapter 10, in verse 12, God says, sow for yourselves. We're right back to the sowing and reaping. Plant for yourselves righteousness and reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. You've plowed wickedness and reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of your lies. You trusted in your own ways. You're going to pay for that. Go back to chapter 2. Beginning in verse 14, you remember that God's put her away and he's bringing her back and he says, I will allure her and I will bring her into the wilderness and I will speak comfort to her and I will give her vineyards from there in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. She will sing there as in the days of her youth and the day she came up from the land of Egypt. And it will be in that day, says the Lord, that you will call me my husband and no longer my master. I will take from her mouth the names of the bells. They'll be remembered no more by name, to the, by name no more. In that day I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the creeping things of the ground. Bow and sword of battle I will shatter from the earth and make them lie down safely. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you will know the Lord. It will come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the heavens 
and they will answer the earth, and the earth will answer with grain and new wine and oil, and, and, and they shall answer Jezreel, and I'll sow her for myself in the earth, and I'll have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they will say, and you are our God. Here's, here's the grand message of the gospel. If we'll just plant righteousness, what God has in store for us is so far beyond our ability to grasp that it's beyond our ability to grasp. Dad's going to preach on heaven tomorrow night. I asked him, so what are you going to say? Because i got news for you, folks. I don't think we have a clue how good heaven's going to be. But it demands some work from us. It demands we get up every day and plant good stuff. That, that, we, that we embrace the message of love and the way we ought to act to one another. And that, that we break our fallow ground. Look at chapter 10 and verse 12 again. Break our fallow ground. You, you know, repentance. That's, this is what the message is. Repentance is a hard thing. And there's not a pill you can take. There's not a five-step plan. You can't go do a little seminar and learn about repentance. You know what repentance is? It's like everything else in discipleship. It is a pure act of will where I get up every day and decide I'm going to serve the Lord and not myself. That's repentance. And nobody can do it for you. And some days it's going to be terribly hard. But every day we're planting seeds. Every day. So, so let's get up tomorrow and let's go be godly people. But let's get up tomorrow and, and let's avoid sin. But let's get up tomorrow and let's be patient with one another and let's give ourselves to a consideration of the Word of God and let's work on our leadership and our fellowship and our worship and make sure we're doing good and make sure we're repenting. But let, let's stand up in the culture around us no matter what the clashes are, no matter what the demands are, and, and let's go start planting something good. Because the consequences are going to come. That, that's why Galatians chapter 6 says, Therefore, as you have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are a household of faith. Do not be weary while doing good in due season. You'll reap if you do not lose heart. It may be years. You young people, you may have a whole lifetime of difficulty ahead of you, but if you get up every day and sow something besides wind, rest assured when the crop comes in, you will be extremely pleased to be the child of God. What a message. It scares me to death. But it gives me incentive every day to get up and go be what God asked me to be. Let's plant some good stuff. You can start that tonight if you never obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're, 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 you're giving yourself to God. You're planting spiritual things so that you can reap an association with Him. If you need to do that, then, then get after it. Drop the first seed right now. If you need to make your life right, you need to repent because you've not been living right. If you need to work on your love or whatever it is, you need the Savior. Come to him tonight while we stand this.